The Secret Stories of Saint Seiya Part 1 is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is the first game to bring a true console level experience to your phone. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions blessed with unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. I've been playing Raid for a while now, and two of my favorite champions would have to be Ursula the Mourner and Tutora Rhymehide. Ursula, a legendary champion, can cripple enemy attacks while boosting the attack of her own team, and Tutora Rhymehide acts as an excellent defense when navigating through the Hydra and Doom Tower. And he just looks really freaking cool and kind of like an adorable griffin looking pet. And this month for Raid is huge. They just released a brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers, with some amazing new champions. Forest Elves, Druids, Fae's, they're all here. And if that's not enough, Raid's got a full lineup of events, along with a new season of the Forge Pass, where you can get your hands on some of the most powerful gear the game has ever seen. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. And if you haven't started playing Raid, Click my link in the description box or scan my QR code here on the screen. You'll get unique bonuses worth $30. This includes a free epic champion, Ina, 200k silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in-game. Hordes of treasure awaits you for the new players of Raid Shadow Legends. There will always be some element of chance involved in detective work. We start our search with a series of clues and cross them off as we go, hoping they'll eventually lead us to the unequivocal answers that we seek. Each new piece of information we uncover reveals a fresh strand of the vast informational web we're traversing, which is etched against a glimmer of light. But what happens when all these doors that undoubtedly should bring us to the right place instead reveal new answers to questions we never even thought to ask. What if all the hints you followed to get to that closed door turn out to be the keys to opening another? Most would assume that this would serve as a distressing realization. For those who have dedicated countless hours of their lives gathering clues and investigating sources, only to discover that this whole time they've been barking up the wrong tree. But contrary to this mishap that may at first seem totally unfortunate to someone on the outside, a lot of investigators would tell you that this scenario does, in fact, have its own silver lining. Setting your sights on a lost artifact only to make an entirely different find through that same search to a lost media hunter is always a welcome surprise. It's like striking gold. We tend to call this sort of phenomenon an act of serendipity, or a serendipitous find, which is by definition, an unplanned and fortunate discovery made through a chance occurrence of events. Since the beginning of time throughout the history of product invention and scientific discovery, serendipitous events have taken place. Even though these kinds of moments have existed for ages, this term can be traced all the way back to the 17th century in a letter written by English writer and art historian Horace Walpole on January 28, 1754. In a letter to his friend Horace Mann, Walpo wrote of an unexpected discovery he made of a lost painting of Bianca Capello by Giorgio Vasari, and used the term in reference to an old Persian fairy tale known as the Three Princes of Serendip. In this story, the princes were always making discoveries by accidents and sagacity of things which they were not in quest of. Finding something completely new and unexpected, rather than leaving a search totally empty-handed, is a dream shared by digital historians, preservationists, and lost media hunters alike. And if you happen to find yourself in a moment of serendipitous discovery, it is essential to keep an open mind. Sure, you might not have found exactly what you were looking for, but what's been unearthed in its place? has the potential to be equally as valuable. And perhaps the most fascinating aspect of these serendipitous discoveries is the six degrees of separation that lies in between. You'd be surprised at how many lost media investigations can have a source that acts as a gateway to answers on an entirely different lost subject. Let's say you're looking for lost footage and manage to track down the CEO of an animation studio. Though you're unsuccessful in obtaining said footage, that very same CEO knows a friend of a friend 
friend who, for example, has audio recordings of an unreleased artifact from an entirely different show. A serendipitous moment never comes up short when you're looking for lost media, because all that's lost has an intrinsic value to the communities that are looking for it. This very same concept of seeking out one thing and finding something completely different is exactly what played out in my latest investigation. In tonight's episode of Tales of the Lost, I retrace my steps and reach out to old leads from my previous investigation on the company Renaissance Atlantic in the hopes of finding some answers to another heavily guarded secret. This time, it's not the live-action Sailor Moon pilot I'm after, but rather another lost live-action pilot the company was rumored to have worked on, an Americanized adaptation of the 80s shonen anime known as Saint Seiya. Through my investigation, I revisit old leads, discover new people of interest, and learn of more lost artifacts warranting their own unique investigations that I never expected to fall onto my radar. With nothing to go off of but a 20 second clip and a handful of speculation, was I able to unearth the full pilot through this six degrees of separation? Or did my investigation, in the end, lead me to standing in front of a locked door with a pocket full of bad keys? Find out what happens next in part one of The Secret Stories of Saint Seiya. Fresh off of the adrenaline rush of my last discovery, I was eager to set my sights on a new piece of lost media to do a deep dive exploration on. There were so many potential topics that piqued my interest, each with their own unique rabbit hole worth exploring. Perhaps I could look into more unreleased games, or maybe even television ads from the past that had gone lost and unarchived. After my previous discovery, so many fresh ideas began to form in my mind. But in the end, I made the choice to focus on a subject that felt a little more personal. I turned my attention onto a familiar face, a company known as Renaissance Atlantic. Yes, that very same Renaissance Atlantic that had a hand in the Americanized live-action pilot of Sailor Moon. A company owned by former Bondi America president Frank Ward. The same Frank Ward who, funnily enough, had helped me only a few months earlier in my attempt to obtain this missing pilot through the Library of Congress. Renaissance Atlantic was known for being the arm between Bondi and Toy Animation to the Western market. And aside from their cancelled Sailor Moon project, the company was also in talks to Americanize and adapt countless other popular Japanese anime for North American audiences. This was something I came to learn more about throughout my investigation. And during my time scouring information in the archives of the Library of Congress, I came to discover exactly what sort of anime had the potential for American adaptations. And what I saw on that list came as a bit of a surprise. In an alternate timeline, had the acquisition of certain shows gone differently, it's possible our introduction to Japanese animation would have been entirely different with a completely different impact on our culture. I can't even imagine how our animation and pop culture would be shaped with the absence of Japanese anime, a medium that's been so highly influential in modern storytelling and art. It was that very moment some months ago when I was researching in the Library of Congress that's really stayed with me. I wanted to learn more about 
about that catalog of shows Bondi and Toy had discussed with Frank Ward and his team. And it was this whole deep dive in my efforts to uncover Sailor Moon that got me started on this trajectory towards another somewhat known, closely guarded secret held at the company. Among the many sizzle pieces and pilot scripts that had been submitted to the copyright library, I noticed a very familiar entry name. There was a listing of an adaptation for an anime that could generally be described as an early male counterpart to Sailor Moon. It was a listing of the successful 80s shonen anime known as Saint Seiya, a show adapted by Toei Animation with toy distribution handled by Bondi that was curiously at some point in association with Renaissance Atlantic, a company I had previously done extensive research on. Apparently, before Saint Seiya had been dubbed in North America, like Sailor Moon, the series had also been in talks at being reimagined from the ground up with a completely different name unique to the original series. Knowing this, I thought it only made sense that my next adventure would be a continuation down this familiar rabbit hole. With the company being an already opened window, I knew it could act as a perfect springboard for uncovering new information. But before we take the big leap into what exactly this lost Saint Seiya adaptation is and what I hope to find, it's important to make sure that we're all on the same page. Some of you are totally familiar with the original series in question, and that's great. But despite the anime having reached a global and mainstream success in and outside of Japan, there's still a staggering amount of people who know little to nothing about Saint Seiya. In fact, a lot of people, including myself, could not recall much from the series. Growing up, it was always one of those shows I'd see in passing or I'd catch bits and pieces of it when waiting for other anime to air. I know. Most people I've spoken to couldn't even easily identify the series and quite frankly wrote it off as a lesser known male equivalent to Sailor Moon. And it might come as a surprise, but this is a widely shared sentiment among those unfamiliar with the series, especially to the many viewers in North America. But after embarking on my own investigation, I learned more about what truly made this show so special, and gained a newfound appreciation for this series that quite literally pioneered an entire genre of anime. In reality, Saint Seiya is so much more than just a magical boy's cartoon. The common misconception of Saint Seiya being a male counterpart to Sailor Moon is actually not a claim that's entirely out of pocket. Both series had a huge impact on anime and their respective genres on a grand scale, and continued to influence both its viewers and the animation industry outside of Japan. Through its own unique way, Saint Seiya's managed to reshape the landscape for shonen anime and flip the entire genre on its head through subversive ways of storytelling that had once been unfamiliar to the magical boy genre as a whole. Saint Seiya Seiya, also known as Saint Seiya Knights of the Zodiac, or simply Knights of the Zodiac, is a Japanese manga series written and illustrated by artist and writer Masami Kuramata. The Japanese series follows a 13-year-old boy named Seiya who, aided by his four fellow warriors known as the Saints, must fight to defend the reincarnation of the Greek goddess Athena in her battle against the Olympian gods that wish to take over the Earth. Each warrior fights wearing sacred sets of mystical armor known as cloths, and each cloth is based on very various constellations the characters have adopted as their destined guardian symbols, all empowered by a mystical energy known as Cosmo. Of the 48 bronze saints, Seiya wields the sacred cloth and mystical powers of the Pegasus that is protected under the Pegasus constellation. The first chapter of the series focused heavily around a tournament known as the Galaxian Wars, a battle between bronze knights who wish to win the most powerful cloth known as the Sagittarius Gold Cloth. In Seiya's quest to win the gold cloth and his battle against the Olympian gods, he's aided by four other bronze saints. Cygnus Yoga, a Russian fighter with powers of ice manipulation, Dragon Shiryu, a warrior known for his great strength and ability to invoke the energy of the dragon, and Andromeda Shun, a gentle spirit and true pacifist by nature, wielding an immense hidden power that makes him stronger than he actually appears. The team is later joined by Shun's older brother, Phoenix Iki, originally introduced as an antagonist. Iki is a powerful bronze saint that can channel wind and heat abilities of a rising phoenix. With their unique powers combined, these five saints possess an unstoppable force that can be harnessed to take down the evil gods of Mount Olympus once and for all. 
Saint Seiya proved to be immensely popular in Japan and had a lasting impact on the animation industry on a global scale. The series paved the way for modern shonen anime series to follow and was unique from the typical Magical Boys format through its showcasing of diverse forms of masculinity. It had plot-driven fantasy, a compelling story with different arcs, multi-dimensional characters, intense battle sequences, suspenseful plot twists, and even underlying themes of Greek mythology, religion, and spirituality. It wasn't just a show that highlighted teamwork amongst friends, had interesting designs and cool costume armor, but also focused on more mature subject matter where the stakes were high and the consequences were dire. Saint Seiya has this magical duality of opposing themes that managed to keep it fresh and innovative to its audience, elevating its popularity and creating a similar impact to the likes of Dragon Ball, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and Fist of the North Star. Saint Seiya's influence has been noted to be a primary inspiration behind many massively successful anime that preceded it, and these shows all went on to bring their own uniqueness to the shonen genre such as Ronin Warriors and Mobile Suit Gundam. Tite Kubo, the creator of Bleach, even credited Saint Seiya as a major inspiration for his design sensibilities and action-filled battle sequences. Overall, the anime and manga were essential in igniting the 80s anime craze, both domestically and internationally. Since the original anime is released, the series has had many spin-offs, 13 albums, numerous video games, 3 OVAs, 6 animated feature films, and 2 original net animations, with the most recent titled Knights of the Zodiac Saint Seiya having premiered on Netflix in July of 2019. There's even been talks of a live-action film adaptation on Netflix stated for release sometime next year in 2023. As of 2022, the Saint Seiya manga has sold over 50 million copies, making it one of the best selling manga series of all time, with both the original manga and anime finding success internationally across Asia, Europe, Africa, and Latin America. And for a variety of different reasons, the series has had a surprisingly large and growing cult following in Southern and Latin American speaking countries, which has greatly contributed to its ongoing longevity and success overseas. Let me explain. Outside of Japan, Saint Seiya was met with exponential success overseas, and more specifically, the series' largest fan base was dominated by fans from Latin America and Spanish-speaking countries such as Costa Rica, El Salvador, Mexico, and Nicaragua. There are several theories as to why the anime resonated so strongly with its Latin American audience, many of which are not explicitly stated. But from my research, I was able to infer some of the most popular explanations as to why the anime resonated so profoundly with South and Central American audiences. Unlike the early standard dubbing practices we'd see in English dubs, Saint Seiya was localized in Latin America with very minimal censorship. These more relaxed translations made it very popular among teens and children, but also caused somewhat of a stir among adults and conservative news groups. However, most fans praised the dub for staying as close as they could to the original source material. With networks and cable TV not having broadcast a lot of anime in the late 80s, the caliber of Saint Seiya was unmatched. It was pretty unique from the few anime that had been dubbed, with the exception of Dragon Ball releasing sometime after. The structure of the series kept Latin American fans on the edge of their seats and eager for new episodes to air, and has been best described as an action-oriented, dramatic telenovela made for kids. The show was remembered fondly for its catchy theme song and stellar voice cast, and its spreading popularity in this region was akin to that of the Pokemania craze of North America. America in the late 90s. And with Catholicism being a popular religion, many fans could relate to the show's themes of religion and spirituality, coupled with its mythological inspired elements. To better help me wrap my brain around how meaningful the series was to people on a personal level, I asked viewers of the Latin American Saint Seiya community to explain in their own words why the show meant so much to them. And there seemed to be a shared sentiment on the show's positive influence. Saint Seiya wasn't the first anime to be successful in Brazil. There were anime and tokusatsu shows in the 60s and 70s that were the first ones, but Saint Seiya was the first anime for a new generation. Being broadcasted for the first time in 1994, no other anime was nearly as successful or in the mainstream at the time as Saint Seiya became. Sure, it was aimed at the boys. Sailor Moon wouldn't be on until 1996, but every single kid knew 
what it was. It was a different thing when I watched it. All I'd known previously was Dragon Ball. Saint Seiya had a different kind of teamwork and friendship that felt special. The emotions in the music just complemented it a lot more. Plus, characters had some nice developments and depth. Seiya had ambitions that became a mission. Hayoga had duty that became friendship. Shiryu had pride that became honor. Shun had innocence that became love. And Nikki had confusion that became heroism. They had dimensions. I know this sounds absurd, but Saint Seiya was and is part of our national identity. Back then, most of us didn't understand that anime was foreign, and while there was TV aimed at kids produced nationally, there wasn't a whole lot, so anime like Saint Seiya filled this cultural void. Well, Saint Seiya was the very first show where my demographic, feminine men, had any sort of positive representation. Andromeda Shun was the first character that I, as a child, recognized was like me. It was quite revolutionary for its time, to be honest. It was just everything about him. Not just his feminine appearance, but his personality as well. Being of peaceful nature, soft-mannered, and disliking violence, Shun being one of the main characters and one of the good guys was a big deal. Feminine men were often portrayed as villainous in the media. There are a number of reasons as to why Latin American communities resonated so deeply with Saint Seiya, but its lasting impact is ever so apparent in the passionate words of fans who have been keeping the series into the mainstream since its initial debut. For whatever reason, the formula just stuck and completely changed the anime experience for generations of anime fans alike. It's impossible to deny the impact of this series, but even after my thorough explanation of what made it so special, I still get the feeling that my core audience isn't entirely convinced. A lot of you may be thinking, well, I'm an anime fan, I didn't care much about this show, why didn't I remember anything about it? To be honest, I wouldn't blame anyone who still isn't convinced, because I mean, seeing is believing, and if you haven't seen the outward influence of its success, how can you possibly believe in the supposed immense staying power and constant praise from others? Well, if you're in Asia, Europe, or even Latin and South America, Saint Seiya's notoriety may not come as much of a surprise to you, but if you reside in North America, America, it might be a different story. Unfortunately, for reasons outside of our control, Saint Seiya was generally not as renowned in North America in comparison to other countries. The love for the series and fan response was nowhere near as impactful as anime such as Digimon, Pokemon, Sailor Moon, or even Dragon Ball, a country with arguably the world's foremost economic and military power with a jarring amount of influence on modern day pop culture and celebrity, hadn't had the greatest introduction to the likes of Saint Seiya. Its absence of a North American audience, despite its growth, really says something about the series as a whole. I can't imagine Saint Seiya having an even greater impact than it has now, and its impact is already quite massive. The possibilities of where its success could have taken it if it had that proper introduction to North America is pretty profound. Had the series gotten the same treatment as similar anime that had blown up in the West, it could have potentially overtaken the boom of early 90s anime which would have really altered not only our early perceptions of anime, but also could have changed exactly when anime really took off culturally in North America. It could have had so much potential. So how is it that dubbing companies could have passed up on such an opportunity to make the show even more highly regarded, thus bringing in more profit? What if I told you that this poor introduction to this anime was by no fault of the series, but rather can be chalked up to a horrendous localization process and ultimately an issue of poor timing? With all we knew about early English dubs, a mistake like this wouldn't really come as a surprise. But with how much successful anime had been imported into the USA, in the early 90s, only some years after the release of Saint Seiya, one could only wonder why not as much consideration was put into its localization process. Though Saint Seiya proved to be immensely popular around the globe, my memories with the series, if I'm being frank, were few and far between. Ultimately, it was never a show that really stood out to me, nor would I have ever identified it as something groundbreaking when I first watched the English dub back in 2003. This is something quite a few people living in Canada and the United States would agree with, but by no means did my lack of interest in the series imply that Saint Seiya was some horribly uninspired anime, but rather, unlike fans outside 
outside of North America, we never got to see the real series in all of its raw, unfiltered glory. The failure of Saint Seiya in the United States and Canada becomes painfully clear once you examine the arduous journey the series had to navigate through in order to make it to English speakers' television screens. There are a few key events that contributed to its demise surrounding terrible localizations and generally poor timing. In July of 2002, ADV Films announced that they'd purchased the rights to releasing Saint Seiya in North America through a sub-license agreement they shared with the French studio Deke Entertainment. In the United States, Deke had sold 40 episodes of the series to Cartoon Network under the new name of Knights of the Zodiac. This dub would be produced and edited in Toronto, Ontario, and would also go on to air in Canada under the children's television network called YTV. The series made its North American debut on August 30th of 2003. I grew up watching this series, and I can say with all certainty that this dub was an absolute nightmare. Watching the dub a second time around, I'm reminded of why the series never stood out to me. No love was put into staying true to the original source material, and it wound up becoming a horribly produced low-bar dub. Over the years, Knights of the Zodiac became infamous not for its original story, but for the memes that were born from all of the terrible dubbing changes that had been put into place. The dub contained a lot of unnecessary video edits where multiple episodes would be cut and pasted together, along with unfunny jokes used to fill in serious dialogue in moments where there should be silence. These alterations in turn created plot holes and inconsistencies with the original story. It also came with an unusually high level of censorship in terms of its depictions of violence, which was strange because at that time, censorship practices were becoming much more relaxed, so it was clear they had no understanding of who their target audience was supposed to be. Blood was recolored and any mention of death was completely omitted and rephrased as going to another dimension or falling asleep, which only further added confusion to the story. Character names were changed and personalities were altered, such as Cygnus Hyoga, known as Swan Hyoga in the dub, now suddenly having a stereotypical surfer boy accent. And finally, the once iconic Pegasus fantasy theme song was now replaced with a cover of the Flock of Seagulls song I Ran by American 80s rock band Bowling for Soup, which was not a bad song, but that's entirely besides the point. Of course, none of these changes went over well, and Cartoon Network wound up pulling the series from air due to abysmal ratings after only 32 episodes in April of 2004. While in Canada, all 40 episodes aired before the series' cancellation. Of the 40 episodes that have been dubbed, only 28 have ever had a DVD release, which means over the years, the remaining 12 episodes are now considered to be lost media. And with the dub having been long out of circulation since the series' cancellation, and Deke closing its doors in 2008, the DVD release of this dub is extremely hard to come by. I actually remember watching a few episodes of the Deke dub here and there, and would occasionally catch the end of episodes when waiting for other anime to air. But had I known the remaining 12 dubbed episodes would have someday become lost media, I probably would have utilized my VHS recorder a lot more often and a lot more frequently. Though I do remember recording partial episodes of Saint Seiya, sadly when I recently I recently took a look through my VHS collection, none could be found. Perhaps it was on one of the tapes I'd thrown out before I moved. Fortunately, in recent years, Lost Media community members had managed to recover a few VHS recordings of the lost episodes in question. Of the fully recovered episodes, 10 episodes remain completely lost to this day. But unfortunately, the mishandling did not stop here. We also need to discuss the failure of the ADV dub. Parallel to the Deke release, ADV Films also decided to produce their own uncut version of Knights of the Zodiac, opting to use the original Saint Seiya name, which was also released in 2003. This series was produced using a different voice cast and was recorded in the Houston, Texas area. The direct-to-DVD release occurred from October 21st, 2003 to May of 2005. While they had intended on completing the series, they were only able to sub-license a total of 60 episodes from their previous deal with with Deke Entertainment, therefore also rendering this second dub of Saint Seiya as unfinished. So once again, fans in 2003 were still unable to get a complete English dub of the series. And though there was now an uncut DVD version, the few fans that the series had at the time were still robbed of a satisfying conclusion to an already hard to watch anime they'd been keeping up with through DVD releases. And from what I can gather from the few clips left online, while the ADV dub kept in the violence 
violence and didn't retain the same major edits of the Deke dub, it still had a handful of its own issues. The script dialogue was sadly somewhat awkward, including odd line delivery from characters whose voices didn't seem to fit. Their attempt at rectifying Deke's mistake of veering too far from the source material was still a very half-baked attempt at best. As a result, the ADV dub gave rise to a few of its own memes. Furthermore, despite having more episodes dubbed, it only received a direct to DVD release, relegating it into obscurity in comparison to its Deke counterpart, which aired on television that same year. Without having watched the uncut ADV dub, it's hard to say how close it stayed to the original series, but based on the fact that they were only able to sublicense 60 episodes with no renewal, it may be safe to say that the straight to DVD release was also met with poor sales and low visibility. All in all, each dub catered to a completely different audience, and only further confused fans when they released both dubs simultaneously. And this would eventually lead to another problem contributing to its failure in North America that I would like to refer to as the dreadful dub confusions. Imagine you're a 10 year old kid living in North America. It's 2003 and you catch a glimpse of a show on television called Knights of the Zodiac. It seems really cool and exciting, but you always seem to miss the new episodes when they air. And because of this, you have trouble following the storyline. So you decide to go to the video store with your parents one day, and when browsing the aisles, you spot a DVD with characters from that show with the cool knights, except it's now labeled Saint Seiya the Uncut Version. You wind up convincing your parents to buy it, and as soon as you hit play on your DVD player, you're surprised to discover that the anime is entirely different from what you watched on television. You're now disappointed to find that the storyline, voice acting, and edits aren't the same, leaving you pretty confused as to what's going on. And on top of this, both the TV series and this new dub in your possession have no concluding episode to wrap up the series. I know adult anime fans of the early 2000s would have caught on to this difference, but imagine experiencing this as a child. What makes this worse is the fact that both the Deke dub and the ADV dub have the ADV logo slapped on the bottom of their respective packaging. Despite being labeled as the uncut version, this could have been an easy mistake for not only children, but their parents to make upon purchasing. On top of this, finding a DVD release of the original Deke dub was very rare. I was 10 years old in 2003. I can't be the only one who sees a problem with this. Lastly, and arguably the most crucial factor that led to the demise of Saint Seiya in North America was this series being released well after its prime. The series was doomed from the start, and not because it aired on dead time slots, but because the Deke dub had been brought over well after it would have been considered new and innovative in the world of anime. Had the licensing companies followed the examples of other international companies and released Saint Seiya around the same time they had localized popular 80s anime like Gundam and Dragon Ball, the series would have fared much better and would have been just as revolutionary to children who hadn't yet been exposed to such a variety of shonen anime. It was too late for the series as a whole to have had a strong grasp on the North American market, and its style was no longer relevant to the times. By 2003, we had already been exposed to anime that had been inspired by Saint Seiya before Saint Seiya could even make its debut. How could an anime that was considered revolutionary, by 80s standards, be expected to compete with a time slot of modern anime like Full Metal Alchemist, Inuyasha, and Bleach that, by then, had already mastered the Saint Seiya formula of what made it so special and improved on it for a younger generation. Aside from the horrible dub deterring my interest from the series, there wasn't anything about the anime I hadn't already seen that would have been able to hold my attention. However, nearly 20 years since the Deke dub had aired, the original anime was finally redubbed a third time by the company Sentai Filmworks, the company responsible for the CGI Saint Seiya dub known as Saint Seiya Knights of the Zodiac. Both the original anime and CGI series were released on Netflix in 2019, making Sentai Filmworks the first company to have dubbed the full 114 episode series into English. It took over 20 years to get a completed dub of an anime that had originally been released in the 80s. This time around, the Sentai Filmworks dub had minimal edits and was much more true to the original source material. Throughout its rocky history in North America, the series still managed to see some moderate success and has a decently sized call following. There are definitely fans of the anime in Canada and the USA, but the difference it could have made for those fans had it not faced so many problems is certainly something to think about. The failures of Knights of the Zodiac is almost historical 
successful in the sense that it is the only Japanese anime to fail in the United States, whilst becoming a mega hit in Asia, Europe, and South America, a fate that Deke CEO Andy Hayward at the time couldn't have ever predicted. In the end, it all boiled down to two horribly produced English dubs and a poorly timed release of a series long after its window of opportunity for it to thrive had passed. It was a cartoon made in the 80s being introduced to a, by then, well-seasoned anime audience of the early 2000s. Saint Seiya's North American failure was a huge missed opportunity and a formula that had been doomed from the start. Its influence, though small, hasn't gone unnoticed. And with the entire original series being fully licensed and released by Sentai Filmworks, along with the CGI project, new fans and a newfound appreciation for the series have emerged. And while this doesn't make up for its disastrous first impression and 20-year limbo, it still serves as somewhat of a bittersweet resolution to a time in history when English anime enthusiasts missed out on something great. So now you're completely up to speed with all things Saint Seiya. You know about the anime's inception, its international success, the cultural impact it had on the animation industry, and why it had such a visibly large fanbase in parts of Latin America. You're even well versed on the reasons why the series had failed in North America. Saint Seiya eventually found moderate success through its spin-offs, redubs, and a handful of media that's followed since. I feel if not for the 2019 CGI adaptation, we probably would have never seen a full English dub of the original anime. Sentai Filmworks, in collaboration with Netflix, redubbed the series shortly after its CGI counterpart, which was the network's attempt at reviving the series and reintroducing it to old and new fans as a palate cleanser for any future adaptations they had up their sleeve. And lo and behold, in 2021, it was announced that in another joint venture with Netflix, an upcoming live-action movie was in the works titled Saint Seiya, Knights of the Zodiac and was slated for release sometime in 2023. Saint Seiya was now following suit with Hollywood's recent tradition of adapting a well-liked anime series into a live-action spin-off. Whether or not this move will help to reignite interest in the franchise for North American audiences, only time will tell. But what if I told you this was not the first time echoes of an American live-action adaptation had circulated? What if I told you just like the potential Sailor Moon had of becoming a hybrid adaptation of live action and American animation that at some point Saint Seiya had also fallen into similar waters of becoming a shell of its former self. With the issues behind its dubs, you may not find this concept to be too far-fetched, especially since it went a whole 20 plus years without a solid English dub. During my time investigating the live-action Sailor Moon pilot, my attention was pulled towards a similarly related piece of lost media, shrouded in an equal amount of mystery. In 1994, a whole nine years before the release of the first English Saint Seiya dub, something had been brewing inside the studios of Renaissance Atlantic, Bandai, and Toei Animation. Something that, had it been given the green light, could have forever altered the show's perception to North American audiences. was 1993, and the hit series Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was the highest rated kids show on broadcast television. Power Rangers was the brainchild of Haim Saban and his company Saban Entertainment. It was a heavily edited, Americanized live action version of the original Japanese series known as Kyoryu Sentai Zero Ranger. The show was a blend of original Japanese fighting sequences and action shots merged together with reshot non-action scenes with an all-American cast, recreating the show from the ground up in a formula they continued to use throughout the series' later incarnations. The show was produced as a joint venture between Haim Saban of Saban Entertainment, Toei Animation, and their American division known as Renaissance Atlantic. Despite being overly predictable, corny, and somewhat formulaic, Power Rangers was a huge hit in North America, and since its release, its toy division, Bandai Entertainment, has made over $20 million off of merchandise sales alone. American distributors, in response to the success of the series, were now 
on the hunt for the next best-selling Japanese import to introduce to American consumers. Frank Ward, former Bondi America and Renaissance Atlantic president, wanted to take a similar approach of westernizing Japanese media for an American audience by remaking existing IPs that had been originally produced by Toei Animation. It's hard to say exactly what shows were in talks of getting their own adaptations, but perhaps the most widely known concept to have surfaced was that of Renaissance Atlantic's attempt at producing an animated and live-action version of the popular anime series Pretty Soldier Sailor Moon. Eventually, the deal between Renaissance and Toei Animation had fallen through. After turning down their concept for Sailor Moon in favor of Toei having their anime dubbed into English rather than continuing with the plan of creating Americanized adaptations. After a few years of silence, this once private proof of concept eventually leaked to the public and was later dubbed Saban Moon. But where does that leave those other failed projects? Somewhere in the archives of Renaissance Atlantic are TV Bibles, elevator pitches, and full-blown pilot episodes of live-action anime adaptations, all hidden away with limited access. The Saban Moon pilot was one of the earliest known live-action spin-offs produced by Renaissance Atlantic, and since my last investigation, we now not only have a bunch of answered questions to that mystery, but also now have the full pilot in its entirety. And though it's currently the most popular piece of lost media held at the company, it's actually not the only Americanized adaptation that's managed to slip through the cracks and into the public eye. As a matter of fact, there exists remnants of a live-action adaptation from the anime Saint Seiya, an IP Toei and Bandai had exclusive rights to that had been produced sometime in 1994 in tandem with Saban Moon. All that exists of this series is in the form of a 20-second trailer that had been circulating the internet for some time under the new name Starstorm. Much is still unknown about this lost pilot, but we do know that the project was quickly shot down by Masami Kuramata, the creator of Saint Seiya, and the idea was scrapped altogether. In a 2003 interview with Pierre Jenner for the 97th issue of Anime Land magazine, Masami Kuramata had this to say about the pilot project. Some years ago, a project about a Saint Seiya live-action movie came to my office. In Hollywood, there was a pilot of 15 minutes, but the essence of the series was not respected. The designs and realization made us think about the Ninja Turtles and the names were changed. The project was abandoned because they couldn't obtain a satisfactory result. Aside from it being live action, it's hard to say how close they would have kept it to the original story, but Kuramata noted that the project had been abandoned and that the essence of the series was not respected. To this day, the full Starstorm pilot hasn't seen the light of day. Aside from Kuramata, the only people to have witnessed the pilot in full are those who worked at Renaissance Atlantic, Bondi, and Toei Animation during its production. All that's been leaked to the public was a 20 second trailer, and the project is considered to be a part of lost media. And curiously, it was during my time researching in the Library of Congress that this Starstorm pilot had fallen onto my radar. An entry for it was listed in the copyright catalog database when I had looked for titles under Renaissance Atlantic. Unfortunately, digging deeper into this, I had discovered that the 15-minute pilot hadn't been submitted to the catalog, but rather the 20-second trailer that had been circulating online. Why was the trailer here but not the full pilot episode? Perhaps the pilot had been misfiled at the facility? There were so many questions beginning to unravel and there was just so much overlap between the Sailor Moon and Saint Seiya pilots that I just knew Starstorm would be next in my search. With the resources I had managed to pull during my investigation of all three companies, it seemed like the perfect avenue to unearthing more lost finds regarding this live action pilot. And with this collection of leads at my disposal, it was time to begin my deep dive investigation into the mysteries of Starstorm. So now that you know about the origins of this mysterious trailer, what exactly do I hope to find in my investigation? Ultimately, my main goal is to retrieve a clean copy of the lost 15-minute Starstorm pilot and, if possible, any extra information pertaining to the pilot's creation, whether it be behind-the-scenes footage, pages from the show bible, or even some sort of contact with the cast and crew. But before I could dive into my search, I had to make sure all of my ducks were in a row. I wanted to make sure I had a comprehensive list of all my previous 
previous sources that would be relevant to this new investigation. Unlike my previous hunts, there was a lot less readily available information regarding this media, so I figured if I made a clear map of my leads, everything would run much smoother. Obviously the most important people of interest were employees I'd previously interviewed that had worked with Renaissance Atlantic from 1993 to 1994. I would retrace my steps and see if Rocky Solotov of Tunemakers would be able to shed any light on this project. Having worked with the company in 1994 on the live-action Sailor Moon project, it's possible he may have heard whispers of this or other live-action adaptations through passing conversations. Another individual I felt it would be worth speaking to was Ellen Prince, who from 1994 to 1997 worked as a development and production executive for Renaissance Atlantic. With her having overseen the creative development of over 20 live-action television series, it was possible she could have been present for the production of the Star Storm pilot. In my last investigation, I had been given Ellen's contact information through an outside source and was given permission to call her. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, I was unable to get a hold of her. Perhaps this time would be different. As there was a high chance of crossover, I also thought it would be relevant to reinvestigate the company Deke Entertainment. In my last documentary, it turned out that some elements from the 1994 pilot of Sailor Moon had been recycled back into the Deke dub of the anime series. With the licensing of Saint Seiya also having been acquired by Deke, it wouldn't be so far-fetched to assume that there's a strong likelihood that, just like with Sailor Moon, elements from Star Storm could have also been recycled back into its Deke dub. With Star Storm being created in 1994, I would specifically need to look for leads who worked at Deke Entertainment around that same time frame. Also, as a bit of a bonus to my search, I decided that if I managed to get in touch with employees who worked at Deke, I would make sure to also inquire about the lost episodes from the 2003 Deke dub. It might not yield the results I'm looking for, but there could be a possibility that someone at the company still held on to those tapes. Masami Kuramata, the designer of Saint Seiya, was someone I almost tried to contact, but I ultimately decided against it and removed his name as a potential lead. Though he would have been a perfect choice, not only were the chances of getting into contact with him incredibly slim, but I had a strong feeling that though he saw the pilot all those years ago, it was probably not something he'd be in current possession of. Based on a later interview with Anime Land magazine, Kuramata had done a private screening for Pierre Jenner. Based on what he recalled from the video shown, it can be assumed that Pierre was only shown the trailer, as much of what he said was everything we had already seen from the 22nd clip. But again, I can't say for certain whether or not the pilot had been shown in its entirety, and I'm basing my assumption purely off of what had been echoed in the article. Perhaps if my other sources lead me to a dead end, this would be something I'd end up revisiting. Before we continue, I'd like to ask that you please take a moment to like the video and subscribe to the channel. These documentaries are the most creative and in-depth content I've been able to make on my channel, and while they're rewarding and a lot of fun to do, they come at a bit of a cost. They can be incredibly time-consuming to piece together, and even staying away for more than a few weeks and not posting can severely affect a person's visibility in the YouTube algorithm. If you're enjoying the Tales of the Lost series and want to help keep it alive, your subscriptions and channel support can make all the difference. I'm currently trying to reach 100k in the next couple of months, and a higher view and sub count could help to bring in more sponsorships that can, in turn, support these higher quality documentaries. That being said, if you'd like to go a step further than just liking and subscribing, it would mean a tremendous amount if you joined my community over on Patreon. Pledging as little as a dollar a month, you'll not only be helping to support myself and my work, but a pledge will also grant you special access to our Discord server, where you can meet and connect with other members members of our lost media and gaming community. You can hang out in the general chat, share artwork and memes, and even suggest lost media topics that you'd like to see covered in future documentaries. Patrons will receive early access to videos, previews, and more behind the scenes content. If you'd like to pledge or read more information, you can head over to patreon.com slash raymona or click the link provided in the description box below. Thank you so much for your time, love, and support. And now, let's get back to part one of this Secret Stories of Saint Seiya.
With my list of leads fully in hand, it was time to take a crack at this lost media investigation. I was confident that one of my sources would surely take me down some sort of rabbit hole, and maybe, if anything, new leads would come from my search. With so many different doors standing in front of me, I held out hope that one of them would lead to the answers I'd been seeking. My first order of business was to track down any employees who had worked at Deke Entertainment both in the early 90s and around 2003. Surely I'd encounter someone who knew of the 10 Lost Knights of the Zodiac episodes. Maybe they'd turn out to be hidden away at an ex-employee storage locker. Or maybe, just maybe, someone at the company knew something about the 1994 live-action adaptation. Maybe they would be able to tell me whether or not some elements had been recycled back into the Deke dub. After hours of searching, I ended up finding a handful of names in association with Deke Entertainment. But these sources had little to no digital footprint, and while some of them were barely active on social media, the ones who did have their work posted online provided little to no way of contacting them. I did attempt to send private messages to some, but unfortunately after waiting a few weeks, I had to call it quits. However, all hope wasn't lost, and of the ex-employees listed, I did manage to stumble upon the contact information of a key figure known as Shannon Nettleton. When her name had popped up, I was pleasantly surprised, as I had recognized her as being the current vice president of production at Mattel, the company responsible for the popular American doll line known as Barbie. Examining her profile, I learned that Shannon had over 20 years of industry experience, dating back to her time as a coordinator for Warner Brothers Animation. I had no idea she would have been connected to Deke, and was surprised to learn she had spent 13 years at the company, starting off as an associate producer from 1996 to 2000, only to move up to vice president of production and post from 2005 to 2009. When the company had closed, she even transitioned to working at Wild Brain, formerly DHX Media, a company that had acquired Deke Entertainment when it merged with the company Cookie Jar Group. She had quite the impressive resume, and out of all my sources, had arguably the most experience working at Deke, and fortunately for me, had her contact information open to the public. So I very confidently sent out an email, and I figured at the time, something would come to pass, but I was sorely mistaken. Weeks went by in total silence. I was somewhat naive in my hopefulness that she Shannon would respond. As vice president of production at a multi-million dollar company like Mattel, she must get random inquiries on an almost regular basis. It's possible there was just no time to get to my email, or perhaps she just wasn't interested. And I wouldn't fault her for that in the slightest. Even though I had felt disappointment in the outcome, it was still worth reaching out regardless. This whole thing was proving to be much harder than I thought. Trying to find new people of interest seemed to be the biggest uphill battle, and with every email sent out, time was lost spent waiting for answers in between. But I wasn't ready to just give up, and instead, I decided to move straight to my list of old leads. The list of employees who had worked either with or at Renaissance Atlantic, Ellen Prince and Rocky Solotov. I still had Rocky's number, and had actually spoken with him quite recently. As for Ellen, though I was unable to reach her in my previous investigation, she did mention through a third party that she was open to having a phone call with me, so I figured I'd try again. In a roundabout way, I had come to find out that the number I was given to contact Ellen was, in fact, the wrong number. This whole time, I had been calling someone else. All the while, Ellen must have been wondering why an interview never happened. So I did exactly what I do best at times like this, and after several hours of mind-numbing investigation, I wound up unearthing her real phone number. Now, I will tell you that both interviews had played out quite similarly, and to my surprise, in the end, Rocky and Ellen were unable to provide any information on the aforementioned Starstorm pilot. But in a strange twist of fate, I will tell you that what I had learned from our conversations was like unearthing a Pandora's box of information pertaining to what was in the works behind the scenes at Renaissance Atlantic. Closely guarded company secrets, and discussions on anime that had their own plans at live-action adaptations, outside of Saint Seiya and Sailor Moon, information that would only muddy the waters of this current investigation. So for now, I've decided to close the book on that part of my search temporarily, as the information that was retrieved from these sit-downs are deserving of their own documentaries. Let's just say if I shared all of this right now, it would no longer be a feature on Saint Seiya, and would completely veer off into a different direction. But when the time is right, hopefully once I'm able to wrap up this series, everything will fall into place. Let's just say they were so 
so much more to Renaissance Atlantic than we know, and had things played out differently, it would have had arguably the largest influence on our early perception of anime as a whole. As a last-ditch effort in my search, I did in fact wind up trying to reach out to Masami Kurimata to confirm whether or not he was, in fact, in possession of the full 15-minute pilot, or if what he had shown Pierre Jenner was actually just the 22nd trailer. And as you can imagine, I wasn't even able to get close. Not a phone number, not an email, absolutely nothing. With him being such a prominent figure just like Shannon, getting access to someone like that was not going to be easy, and I knew even doing a deep scrub of the internet wouldn't get me anywhere. The only morsel of evidence I was able to obtain turned out to be information totally unrelated to my case. Ellen could not remember what the production of Starstorm was like, as she had been busy working on another anime adaptation at the time, and Rocky, while working with Frank on independent projects, couldn't recall any pilots relating to Saint Seiya. Their information was overall valuable, but not something that could be used to further my search. I felt as though this was possibly the end of the line in my investigation, and I was ready to accept defeat. A couple of weeks had passed since I had thrown in the towel on my lost media investigation. I was so sure that my efforts would have had some sort of resolve, and that I would have been able to leave my search with new details surrounding the lost pilot. Maybe I went into this situation a little too optimistic. I mean, it had been about 28 years since the pilot's inception, and as dedicated as the Saint Seiya fandom was, little to no information regarding the pilot had ever seemed to surface. There was only brief mention of it in a French anime magazine and of course, the 22nd trailer. And we can't even be sure that the person who uploaded it had any involvement in the project. But perhaps I made the right decision when I let it be known that the subject of my upcoming documentary would be on the original Starstorm pilot. Because as a result of my declaration, I received a number of tips that seemingly by magic led me down a whole new path and restarted my quest for the lost 15 minute tape. Just when I thought all hope was lost, I received three separate tips telling me to search for a woman by the name of Marlene Sharp, who was rumored to have worked with Frank Ward at Renaissance Atlantic sometime in the early 90s. In the tip off side received, I had been told that on her official website, I could find a high quality version of a demo reel featuring all of Renaissance Atlantic's works, and apparently, this reel had included the Starstorm trailer. I was ecstatic. Just when I thought my search was over, my prayers had been answered by a few kind viewers eager to help push the investigation along. This time, I wouldn't let a few bumps in the road deter me from my search. I was directed to Pink Poodle Productions, Marlene's official website. According to what I had read, Marlene worked as a media producer, writer, and strategist in Hollywood. I scrolled through her homepage and looked through her body of work, and at the very bottom of that page was a heading that read, Renaissance Atlantic Demo Reel. Under that heading was a small paragraph that read, You've got the power. In honor of power Power Rangers 30th Anniversary, here is a special presentation from the Pink Poodle Vault. Sing along with these great TV show theme songs of the late 90s to early 2000s. Many thanks to my exceptional former boss, Frank Ward, for the chance to play a role in his action hero empire. Directly underneath the short paragraph was an embedded video, the demo reel I had been informed about that contained the trailer for the Starstorm pilot. And they were right. The reel, produced by Marlene Sharp and a man named Salvador Litvak, showcased many of the works popular popular at Renaissance Atlantic, including a trailer of the Lost Team Angel series, revealing its never-before-seen logo, and more importantly, the 22nd trailer to Starstorm. I pondered Marlene's role at the company, and whether or not she might have knowledge that could help me locate this missing pilot since she had produced the reel. I experienced a simultaneous rush of panic and adrenaline. Whatever the results, I had to reach out, and in contrast to my previous search, it was much easier to obtain Marlene's contact information, so I put my worries aside and decided to contact her on Instagram. This method of contact appeared to be the fastest of all options for reaching her, and that very next day, Marlene had responded. From 
losing all hope in my search to receiving tip-offs about a possible person of interest. I found myself chatting back and forth with Marlene Sharp, a woman who worked at Renaissance Atlantic alongside Frank Ward many years ago. After a brief exchange of messages between myself and Marlene, we agreed to set up a call for a more in-depth exchange about her time working at Renaissance Atlantic. I was quite interested to see what I would learn from our conversation. I had finally succeeded in getting in touch with a fresh lead who actually responded back and was just as eager to set up an interview. Was it conceivable that she had a hand at Starstorm's creation? How did this reel find its way into the public? And would she possibly have a copy or any info regarding the lost tape's whereabouts? I was excited to hear what she had to say. What was your role during your time with Renaissance Atlantic? My role at the company, I started as a temp, worked as a temp for a couple weeks, and then I was hired as an assistant. And then the only other employee of the company, but there was Frank Ward, there was a director of development named Danny Dave, and then there was me, the assistant. Danny left the company, and then it was just Frank and me. So I called myself director of development. I think he still thought of me as an assistant. So there you go. You can ponder that for a little bit. Do you have any stories that stand out from your time working with the team? Yes, and uh, therapy has not erased any of those stories. They're still very vivid in my mind. I worked for Frank as his only employee for about three and a half years. So I worked uh, Frank, Danny, and I in the Beverly Hills office of Renaissance Atlantic for about a year and a half and then an additional three and a half or so years where it was just Frank and me. What was your favorite show to have produced while working there? I wasn't really a producer. Uh, I mean, I did produce stuff. But I never got producer credit while I was there. I think the best credit I ever got was production manager. So I did uncredited producing. And one project that I really enjoyed working on, it's called Little Dracula. And the cartoon was already produced and it was something that Frank owned. Some rights had reverted back to him during the time that I worked for him. So it, it was produced long, long before I worked there. But the rights reverted back to him and he wanted to get the credits in the series changed to reflect that. So I had to work with a post-production house to go in and recut footage and reconfigure the credits so that Frank became executive producer. He, he did not have an executive producer credit until the rights reverted back to him and um, so he had to change things around. But I love that show. It's really brilliant. I think it only lasted one season maybe, but it's by far one of my favorite cartoons ever based on a children's book series, Little Dracula. Are there any keepsakes that you would be able to share with us for the documentary? For example, photos of yourself along with the rest of the crew? This is so crazy, but I do not have, any, I cannot find any photos of myself working at Renaissance Atlantic. However, I do have a lot of pictures, or not a lot, a handful of pictures of the empty office. And I have this one picture I will Hold it up. So I must have gotten roses at the office one day. This was during the days that it was just Frank and me. And if you can see like way in the background here, these dolls, they're basically redressed Barbies. Those are the dolls that were redesigned. We use Barbies as models, but we did costume designs for Team Angel and we had them in the office. We had a, a set of um, the main cast in their regular teenager outfits and then like in action mode. And you can see the other toys in the office. I got a lot of a lot of things from Frank when he closed up shop. So again, no cast or crew pictures, not, no pictures of people, just pictures of two empty offices, but there are some cool toys in the background. So I'll um, try to scan them, send them to you. Do you remember what it was like to work alongside Frank Ward? Yes, I remember. And let's leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. I do remember. Were you an anime fan prior to working at Renaissance? Had you been a fan of Sailor Moon prior to its live action pilot? No, I was not a fan of Sailor Moon prior to the live action pilot. This is a subject that I talk about a lot on podcasts. I would say during the pandemic, I went into overdrive mode with being invited on podcasts. I think some of that has to do with my overall career history and the Sonic the Hedgehog movies coming out because I, I do have history with Sonic the Hedgehog and Sega and also Level 5 and Yokai Watch and anyway with the two uh, Sonic films coming out 
one right before the pandemic and then one sort of during the pandemic. There's a lot of interest in that and I still post online about Sonic from time to time. So I guess that's why I'm invited to people's podcast parties. But anyway, no, I was not a fan of anime at the time. I did not want to get into animation or anime or cartoons or anything like that. I went to school for acting. I have an MFA in musical theater and I was very much focused on an acting career, but life had another way of working out. I did have an interest in working behind the scenes and that's why I turned to temping and temping was a way to get in the offices of various different entertainment companies and work with different teams of people. And so, um, so I did grow to love anime and animation, kicking and screaming, I will admit, but I am very thankful for the time also uh, for a myriad of reasons. I'm thankful for the time that I worked for Frank, but one of the main reasons is that I got acting opportunities because of it. I've done a ton of dubbing on the cartoons that came from that Saban Renaissance Atlantic Bandai factory. One live action project that has remained a mystery to many fans is that of the adaptation of Saint Seiya known as Starstorm. A trailer has been found online and it also appears on the demo reel on your website. Would you happen to still be in possession of this lost tape? Okay, so I don't have the full pilot. All I have is what's on that demo reel. It might have been circa early 90s. Again, it was something that preceded me uh, that Frank had worked on, but he and I had gone through tons and tons of footage when he decided that he wanted to put together this demo reel. And so he, he gave me the footage. So at one time, I guess I did have access to it. The long and short of it is I don't have it. What were your thoughts on anime at the time? What did you think about the studio's aim to convert many anime and Japanese IPs into live action shows after the success of Power Rangers? I have no idea because I will tell you, when I was working on in that area, I was embarrassed to tell people I was working on those shows. You know, my undergrad degree was in drama communications. I had a background in production and then I went on to study in a conservatory setting for my MFA in musical theater. But I considered myself to be an artiste. I felt like I was on track to have a career similar to Tina Fey or Mindy Kaling or Reese Witherspoon in the sense that I was going to be producing all these artful, hilarious, because comedy is, is my jam, projects that I could star in. Like that That was what I wanted to do. And I was embarrassed. Like the, the original Power Rangers that aired in the US, I thought was just like the worst thing I had ever seen. It was, oh my God, the lip sync was off and the, the editing was, anyway. <laughs> I, I didn't want to tell anybody what I was working on, but it's only through the years that I've realized what a gift from the universe it was that I worked on these things because my, most of my career has been spent in kids and family entertainment, working on a lot of Japanese content and um, also a lot of content from other countries. So the skills that I learned working with and around Frank, I've used for my entire career, which has been a considerable amount of time. So very, very thankful for all of that. But I don't have the Saint Seiya pilot. I just have what's on that demo reel. So again, it is um, a head scratcher to me why kids were drawn to Masked Rider and Power Rangers, but thank God they were. Both Sailor Moon and Saint Seiya could have had live action spinoffs had things gone differently. Do you recall any other shows that were being discussed? A Mobile Suit Gundam was one that never happened. What else? We uh, Godzilla we were working on at the time, and I think it became a series shortly after Frank closed up shop. My investigation on this subject led to clues that indicate a Dragon Ball adaptation may have been planned. Is this true? Oh yeah, Frank had done some development before I worked with him on Dragon Ball, because we had some Dragon Ball toys in the office. You could always tell what had been considered for Western export by the toys that Frank had in the office. And we would get so many toy samples. I mean, basically box new toys or we'd get prototypes. And when Frank closed up shop, I took some of it. Some of it we sent to his grandson. Some of it went to a, an antique store, an antique mall in Culver City. And then a lot of it was donated to charity. Somewhere, maybe in the greater Los Angeles area in people's garages are those toy samples, the prototypes and so forth. Anyway, water under the bridge. I don't know what was done on Dragon Ball though. I just remember we had the toys in the office and I remember hearing Frank reference it, but I don't know what exactly 
exactly he did. From a preservationist standpoint, why do you think fans are so intrigued by lost media? Oh, well, it's a, it's a treasure hunt, right? It's like one person's trash is another person's treasure, and it's like thrifting or excavating artifacts like you would do in Egypt or Africa or someplace where you find antiquities. So, um, and of course, a lot of old stuff is available through streaming portals now, so there's some things that people are available to discover through obvious means, but then there's other stuff that's more elusive because of rights issues or degraded film or what have you. So I, I love old stuff, I love vintage stuff, and um, that includes vintage media as well, so I totally relate. If you could turn one show into a live action adaptation, what would it be? Uh, maybe Little Dracula. Gosh, if you can find any of that, I guess maybe some of the episodes are on YouTube. They've been pirated or whatnot. It's so clever and it's based on these British children's books. I would love to do something with that. I just think it's it's so clever, so brilliant. We would love to know more about your current work at Pink Poodle Productions. Well, here's the mascot right here. Here's Blanche. She's actually Bichon Poodle Mix who has appeared in many of my projects. She's on pretty much every podcast that I've ever done. And right now, one of my big projects is a movie trilogy called Young Captain Nemo. And I am working on that for a company called Rainshine Entertainment. I'm executive producing the trilogy. Other things, I still have my fingers in Japanese content, sometimes Korean content, because I've worked for a number of Korean companies. I also worked for a Jordanian company, so sometimes Middle East contacts come calling. <laughs> and uh, uh, Rainshine is an Indian company, so like I said, international companies, that's, that's part of what I do as a consultant under my own banner, Pink Poodle Productions. Thank you so much for this opportunity to interview and I look forward to being in your documentary. I have some pictures that I will try to wrangle from my scrapbooks and scan or take photos of them and send them to you. I enjoyed my time sitting down with Marlene, hearing about her early ambitions and history with the company, along with her relationship to Frank Ward. From her account, it was clear that with the company having been so small, the work had been arduous, and at times, Marlene and the team probably had to wear multiple hats outside of their job description. Though this may have caused some early contentious feelings, Marlene emphasized that at the end of the day, she was very thankful to have worked with Frank, as she credits her time there as a contributing factor to getting her name out of the door and into the animation and voice acting industry. She admitted that at the start of her career, she was slightly embarrassed by the work being done at the company, but eventually came to realize how much of a gift that the experience was in helping her find her career path. A pretty heartwarming turnaround, and it was nice to hear that the end result had led to amicable feelings. Unfortunately, Marlene was unable to provide any details on the lost live action Saint Seiya pilot, as she mentioned production on that project had taken place long before she joined the company. She was, however, responsible responsible for putting together the trailer that could be seen on her showreel, and it was her original edit of this trailer that had been stolen from her YouTube channel and was re-uploaded some years later by another user, which led to rumors of the series spreading throughout the Saint Seiya community. In what felt like a moment of serendipity, I didn't wind up leaving our exchange totally empty-handed. Marlene ended up sharing a lot of valuable information regarding many other anime off of Toei's catalog that were in production for their own Americanized adaptations. What she was able to share with me that day had confirmed a lot of what I had found during my solo investigation in the Library of Congress archives. More lost concepts that never got off the ground, all different stages of production, hidden from the public eye. I felt like I was learning about new and unexplored territories. Previously, looking up entries in the United States Patent and Trademark Office, I happened to come across a Dragon Ball logo registered in 1994 under Renaissance Atlantic. Marlene was able to confirm that Frank Ward had in in fact, been doing some early development on a Dragon Ball series before she had joined their team. She also mentioned development on a Mobile Suit Gundam series and Godzilla, which shortly after their idea was scrapped, wound up having an animated series release in 1998. The show that Marlene was most likely referring to was the animated series Godzilla the Series, based on Godzilla the movie. Marlene remarked that you could always tell what anime had been considered for Western export, based on the toys Frank had in his office. I felt this new piece of information would make it easier 
easier to surmise exactly what shows were in the works at Renaissance Atlantic through the additional photos Marlene had provided. Of the photos shared, there were a few in particular that contained hidden and newfound information containing names that I'd recognized from my time at the Library of Congress. The first three photographs were taken from the inside of the Renaissance Atlantic office on Beverly Drive in California. A few Power Ranger action figures and Sailor Moon dolls can be seen on the bottom desk shelf in the first image. However, what was on the table above was a little harder to identify. Inside of a yellow truck, next to what I would assume to be a miniature poodle, was what appeared to be a number of tiny toy bears. I believe these dolls to be from the Japanese line of miniature animal figures known as Calico Critters, which was first sold in Japan in 1985 under the name Sylvanian Families. The next photograph was taken in another corner of the office. In the lower nook, there's what appears to be a blue Smurf-like character, and there is more Power Ranger merchandise on display. A poster for the Saban series, Masked Rider, can be seen on the left wall, and although it's difficult to tell from the picture, my best guess is that the second poster is from the live-action martial arts program, WMAC Masters. The third office photo was much more detailed, and most likely was the office of Frank Ward. We can see an old TV and VCR set sitting on the back shelf, nested between more Power Rangers merchandise. Additionally, two strange promotional posters are seen positioned at the top of the shelf. The first poster featured three miniature knights set in a medieval period, dressed in various colored armor. It was difficult to determine the exact style of this. I couldn't tell if the animation was Japanese or American. The image was hazy, but it looked like the knights were spraying down a castle-like structure with water. I was certain that this was an advertisement for the unfinished animated series Nutty Nights because I had seen it listed in the Library of Congress. The series slogan was not visible in the image, but my previous research led me to discover that the series slogan had read, The Nights Are Getting Shorter. What sat to the right of the Nutty Knights poster in this photograph was possibly my favorite discovery. I also found a listing for a show called Jungle Lords in the Archives. On the cover, the characters can be seen atop what appears to be a heap of rubble and old concrete. The city behind them looks to be in ruins, and they seem to be living in what appears to be a dystopian future. Because of their skin's bluish-gray tint, the characters' appearance suggests that they are not fully human and may even be androids. They have long limbs and intricate at clothing. Although I couldn't really tell what they were wearing, it appeared to be a combination of samurai robes and gold body armor. I felt that this artwork bore a striking resemblance to the short-lived 1997 Deke television series, Mummies Alive. The bottom text on the poster read, So, you think LA is a jungle now? The last photo revealed the improvised Team Angel prototype dolls Marlene had mentioned during our interview. The clothing was manufactured and tested based on what the girls had worn in the pilot episode, and the prototypes were built using the molds of existing Barbie dolls. For each angel, a variety of outfits that included their battle armor had been created, according to Marlene. Despite not being able to gather many details concerning the Starstorm pilot, the information Marlene shared with me during our interview was extremely helpful in my planned search for other Renaissance Atlantic titles, and confirmed the existence of many other anime and talks to having their own adaptations. I was appreciative of what had come my way, and thought that, after a few little successes, I had come to a stalemate. I had already learned a ton from talking to Marlene, but I still hoped from that interview there would have been material more relevant to the making of Starstorm. Even though Marlene had edited the trailer herself, the full pilot had gotten lost somewhere along the way, and all that was left was a single clip lasting 20 seconds, like a tiny puzzle piece missing from its larger hole. It then dawned on me that my outlook was misguided, and that the glass I was staring at was indeed half full. I was completely ignoring the purpose of my primary objective during my entire investigation. I made note that I would go back over all I had done in search of the missing Starstorm pilot and re-examine all of my evidence in the hope of finding fresh leads. Finding actual people to talk to had kept me so preoccupied that I had overlooked the significance of the 22nd trailer. The trailer was another piece of evidence that had been circulating for a while and deserved to be thoroughly examined on its own. 
The lead was the trailer. At that moment, it was like a light bulb went off. Why didn't I think of this before? I'd exhausted all of my options and hadn't even considered looking at the piece of evidence that had sparked this entire investigation. Now that we just have a 20 second trailer, we're practically back at the beginning. I'm hoping that by studying the Starstorm footage, I'll be able to find some fresh information or new pieces of evidence that can help me in my search. And so begins my analysis of Starstorm. In the trailer's opening, Seiya is shown strapping into his armor. He looks up to the sky and becomes illuminated by a star, which then cues in the Starstorm logo. He appears to be somewhere on Mount Olympus. A bright light transitions to Shiryu and Iki, where we then see Shun in the following shot, peering out from a pillar, watching a battle between the other four bronze saints and what appears to be the gold saint, Cancer Death Mask. Death Mask then unleashes a devastating blast on Shiryu, sending Seiya and his team into grief over their fall and comrade. Shun tries to use her nebula chain in a surprise sneak attack to slow Death Mask down, but her plan is unsuccessful. The video ends with a close-up of Death Mask shattering a scepter as Seiya and Iki are seen fleeing from the temple. And that's where it ends. That's pretty much it. So what can be analyzed from this 20 second clip? Well, the most obvious difference I managed to spot was perhaps a change to Andromeda Shun's gender. Shun is now portrayed as a woman, a change that would be repeated several decades decades later with the 2019 release of Saint Seiya's CGI Netflix remake. So in some strange way, it could be said that the concept of changing Shun's gender from male to female had originated with this project. In this version, Seiya, Hyoga, and Shun are all Caucasian, with Iki being Black American and Shiryu being the only Asian in the group. This cast appears to be less ethnically diverse than that of the Japanese version. The Bronze Saints are all half-brothers in the anime, with the exception of Shun and Iki, who share the same mother. They were all fathered by Japanese tech leader Mitsuma Sakido, with different women from around the world, making many of the saints a mixture of Japanese and other nationalities. As for the location of this clip, my best guess was that they were fighting in the fourth temple of the Golden Zodiac, a place guarded by the Cancer Gold Saints. In the original series, this is the location where Death Mask is defeated by Dragon Shiryu during battle, which could explain why he was the target of Death Mask's attack in the live-action clip. The faces of these actors hadn't been identified anywhere online in the 20 plus years that this trailer has existed. Knowing this, I decided to take it upon myself to examine the clip as best I could in the hopes of identifying the performers in question. Although the video wasn't in the best condition, I reasoned that if I could solve this mystery, it would in turn take me further down this rabbit hole and bring me closer to the answers surrounding Starstorm. It was now only a matter of locating the cast, getting in touch with these newly found leads, and hopefully, if at all possible, securing a chance to sit down and learn about their time working on the pilot. I spent a good couple of days investigating the 20 second clip, watching it over and over, pausing on different frames and trying to map out their faces from different angles. I looked through some of the IMDb credits for actors who had performed in live action shows for Renaissance Atlantic in the hopes that one of the faces I'd come across would match up to what I had mapped out. And after a lot of trial and error, I somehow was able to identify three out of the five knights that I had been looking for. Of the five bronze knights, in the Star Storm dub, I was able to learn the identities of Iki, Shun, and Shiryu. This was it. New leads found completely related to Starstorm, and it was right in front of me this whole time. From just 20 seconds, I had managed to make a little bit of progress in my search, but I still had a long way to go. Of the actors, this is what I was able to find. Actor Gabriel Corbin plays Phoenix Iki in the live-action Starstorm pilot. Corbin, an American actor, singer, dancer, and model from Las Vegas, is best known for his work in the movies The DL Chronicles, Cheetah in August, and Johnson Family Vacation. Corbin, who was born in 1973, would have been in his early 20s when the pilot was being filmed. In my efforts to learn more about the actor, I managed to find an old copy of his acting resume. His representation was under an agency known as the Parmeter Group, which included the company's contact 
contact number. With his last acting credit as a character in the 2019 film The Immortal Wars Resurgence, I figured it was worth a shot to try and call the agency to see if I can get in touch with Gabriel. But apparently, he was no longer affiliated with the agency, so I had to find another way of contacting him. I decided to delve a little bit deeper into Gabriel's social media and ultimately discovered his Instagram. I tried to relay my message there, but it seemed as though he hadn't been active on the platform in some time. Unfortunately, in my pursuit of Gabriel, that's where the trail had ended. But luckily, there were two other actors left that could potentially take me further into my investigation. I discovered that the actress who portrayed Andromeda Shun was none other than Krista Sauls, an American actress from the 1980s. Sauls, who was born on April 15, 1972 in Kingston, North Carolina, is a model and actress who's appeared in TV and films such as The Dentist, Beverly Hills 90210, and Killing Cupid. Sauls found moderate mainstream success appearing in popular films like Conan the Adventurer and has been acting since 1994. With her last active role in 2005, like Gabriel, I was unsure of whether or not Krista had left the entertainment industry. But after searching the web, I was able to pull up the name of the firm she had worked for, the Coast to Coast Talent Group. But when I had called, I was told that they hadn't been Krista's representative for a long time. In a last attempt, I contacted Michael Roth, the director of the 2005 film Killing Cupid, which was Saul's final known project. To my amazement, I received a response from Roth, who said he had been out of touch with the actors for many years and thought she might either be in Southern California or had moved back to her home in North Carolina. Unable to reach two out of three of my leads, I continued to hold out hope that perhaps my final person of interest would be much easier to reach. Dragon Shiryu, played by actor and producer Eddie Mui, was the last saint I was able to name. Eddie is a Chinese-born actor best known for his roles in Gone in 60 Seconds, Someone I Used to Know, and Unidentified. Eddie was still very active in the film industry, in contrast to his co-stars, and had a pretty impressive backlog of roles dating back to 1992, with his most recent appearance in the 2017 romantic comedy Rice on White. Due to Eddie's moderate social media activity, I was able to locate him on Instagram, where I saw that his most recent post was a throwback of the actor from the early 1990s. When I saw the photo, I had no doubt in my mind that this was in fact the right person I was looking for. I made the bold decision to comment directly on his post at that time because I felt as though I had nothing to lose. I asked if he had been involved in the Renaissance Atlantic adaptation of Saint Seiya and if he'd be interested in answering a few questions about it. Checking back, I noticed Eddie liked my comment and from there, our conversation continued through private messages. Eddie provided me with his personal email so that we could arrange for a thorough interview. I was overjoyed. All of my discoveries up until this point had led me to brick walls and dead ends, but at last, I not only managed to get in touch with one of the actors, but he also gave me the go-ahead to sit down and have a more in-depth conversation. Later that week, I wrote down all of my inquiries and forwarded them to Eddie for review. After a few weeks, I assumed he got busy and sent a few nudges here and there, but they were met with silence, and unfortunately, those weeks had turned into months. Eddie had vanished, and our communication had come to a halt. Feeling somewhat defeated in that moment, I knew it was finally time to call it in. My search into finding the Starstorm pilot was not a very easy ride to say the least. I went in very determined to uncover the pilot and had many worries that I'd find myself retreating from my investigation with my tail caught between my legs. Little did I know what would eventually propel me further in my search had turned out to be investigating the clues I already had with a more watchful eye. Had I not sat down and really analyzed the trailer in those final moments, I never would have been able to identify three out of the five actors who portrayed the Saints and Starstorm, and there had even been some brief interaction between myself and one of the actors. Had I not had that support from viewers, I don't think I would have caught wind of Marlene Sharp, a woman who, in almost a serendipitous moment, was able to confirm the existence of other anime that Renaissance Atlantic had been looking to adapt. How far along in the pipeline they were with these projects, only people closest to the company would know. And it was very unexpected to have been shown the original prototype dolls that were intended for use on the Lost Teen Angel series. Though these might all seem like small finds, learning of these supposed pieces of lost media have now opened the doors for more possible discoveries. It's truly amazing to think of the influence this company could have had if they became a major monopoly of Japanese imports. But despite all those 
those new pieces of information, that feeling of disappointment was somewhat looming over me. I desperately wanted to find the 15 minute pilot in its entirety. I felt like being able to identify and track down some of the actors in my search was only the beginning of something much deeper. And having Eddie make some sort of contact after I reached out was only motivating me to push forward in my search. So hopefully after the release of this documentary, there's a chance I may hear back from Eddie, Krista, and even Gabriel. But until then, I'm hoping what I've been able to uncover has managed to light a spark in the community's hunt for this lost pilot. If I can't find it, maybe someone else can. But remember when I said in my last documentary that I was still waiting for the remainder of my order to arrive from the Library of Congress? A few months ago, in my search for the live-action Sailor Moon pilot, I was given permission from Frank Ward to obtain a copy of the pilot and all related media from inside of the Library of Congress. When I had drafted up our contract, I distinctly remember adding any and all titles in the catalog that were related to Sailor Moon, along with alternate title names that I had assumed could have been related to the series. Fast forward to the end of my Starstorm investigation and the strangest thing happened. I honestly couldn't have imagined what was sitting in my inbox that very evening. My initial feelings were of excitement as all of the documents I had ordered from the library had finally come in. I opened the envelope and was surprised to find a CD-ROM. I must have forgotten that one of my orders had an additional piece of digital media. Maybe, like Team Angel, this would turn out to be another Magical Girl spin-off. But as soon as I put that CD in its tray and hit the play button, what I came to find was something completely unimaginable. <laughs> 